uh, a big chunk of action is one action capture Q. We'll start with action and we'll end with action. So let's just read that action action By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made sure. And the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to me, as you can all see. Amen. So, of course, we know with Acts, it's written by Luke, uh, probably funded by Theophilus. So, as you know, both uh, Luke's Gospel and Acts start by reference to Theophilus. And I think the assumption is that Theophilus was a relatively new Christian, someone who was relatively affluent because the parchment and the ink would have covered the price. And he would appear to have been the person that sponsored Luke to write this. He helped me look around and thought, well, Luke looks like a guy. Uh, Luke's a clever guy, you all know, he's a doctor. And he's also a participant in the story as well, as you know, throughout. So Theophilus was the man who was probably the patron in those cold, old fashioned days. And it's thanks to him, actually, this was printed and circulated as both Luke's Gospel and then as Acts. So, obviously, someone who's really keen to ensure that there was an accurate record of what happened, both in the time of Jesus, but also in the time, the early days of the Gospel, was so, so pivotal the growth of the church, wasn't it? And of course, as we know, as we go through Acts, the first seven chapters are all located in Jerusalem and Judea. In Jerusalem and Judea. And by chapter eight, well, Philip goes to uh, Samaria. And then in chapter nine, you have that wonderful story of Paul being converted. The man who was persecuting the Christians is converted and becomes the number one ambassador for Christ. Imagine that being the number one ambassador for Christ. Then Saul becomes Paul. And then in the chapters that run from that, from 13 through 28, the focus is very much on Paul, on his missionary journeys as he travels around. Of course, he ends up in Rome, uh, living under a form of house arrest. And God uses, we all know, he used Paul in an incredible way. And we look at him and go, wow, of all those people, of all those persecutors, could you imagine if he did that with Kim Jong-un? <laughs> or someone like that, you know, off your armour train. Get out there, get your knees, and follow the Lord. But that's the kind of thing the Lord can do. He can do it with anyone. Because he did it with Saul, and he can do it with anyone else as well. So, in this first part, Luke is researching events that he didn't actually witness. He had to rely on, on, on second hand accounts. But uh, by chapter 15, actually chapter 16, by verse 10, we see that actually Luke is in the story. He's there. Uh, verse 10 in chapter 16 it says, And Paul had seen the vision, we. So then Luke becomes a man. In the story. So I thought it's a really interesting thing about Acts is the way in which Luke researches the beginning part just as he has done in the Gospel, because it was written some years after Christ's death and resurrection, but then he inserts himself in. So he clearly then is part of the story. But our story, like his and like so many, is rooted in faith. And if you didn't get the subtle hint about faith, it was very much running through the songs tonight, you know? Our trust is driven by faith, but it's also rooted in fact, and it's rooted in a plan. So what was the plan? Well, Luke ends his gospel with Jesus commissioning his disciples. And then, of course, Jesus returns to heaven. At the end of Luke's gospel, in, in chapter 24, uh, verses 45 and 47, he said, he told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. There was a plan, and there is a plan. 
And our faith has to be rooted in a plan. And that plan started in Jerusalem. We've been talking a lot on our Saturday morning group around Isaiah. We're still studying Isaiah. I know I come here and every time I say that. So let me guess what, on a Saturday morning, we're still studying Isaiah. I think we're at uh, chapter 62, so we haven't actually got far to go. And we'll probably all have been studying Isaiah for, I have no idea, how many years. But so much of it is rooted in this messianic prophecy. What's going to happen? Return from Babylon to Jerusalem. Christ coming. His word spreading out from Jerusalem. And then in times to come, the importance of Jerusalem in the end time. So Jerusalem is key, and it's really important to remember that there was a plan. So let's read Acts chapter 1. I think we're going to read through a few bits of Acts. So let's read Acts chapter 1, the first seven verses. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote for all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he'd chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father promised which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intensely up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you see him go into heaven. <clears throat> will come back because there's a plan. And we need to have faith that that plan is real and it's really. teaching about the kingdom of God. And he told them, do not leave Jerusalem. There was a plan that they had to stick to. And actually, when God speaks to us, it's a pretty good idea if we do stick to what he tells us. We listen, and we have faith that actually God has our best interest. It may be frustrating sometimes, because we want to roar ahead and do this, this, this. But we need to have faith that God's plan is the plan that's going to work. Because it's God's plan. And what did he say? He said, wait for the gift my father promised. So Jesus began to do and to teach. Verse 1, it says that. And would continue, starting with his disciples, and then the apostles. And of course, the word apostle means advocate. Are we advocates for God? We think of advocates in terms of legal role. In, in the Scottish legal system, an advocate is the equivalent of a, of, a, of, a, of a barrister in England. Advocates are people who make the case. Do we make the case? Are we faithful enough that we make the case? And the plan always was, start in Jerusalem and work your way out. That concentric circle, moving on. But how would you felt if you're one of the disciples? You've seen these amazing things happen. You've seen Jesus go through the most horrific death. You had the excitement of Jesus coming back. And then Jesus went again. 
after 40 days. And by the way, guys, you carry on. I just got inadequate. We, we talk about imposter syndrome. You know, when you start a new job and you do something, you have that imposter syndrome where you think, I feel like I need to do this. How can I possibly do that? And you know, these Galileans, how could they possibly be expected to cope? Well, the answer, of course, was that humanly speaking, they couldn't. It would be impossible. But Jesus, first of all, he's given them authority. When you get the authority of the Lord, that's proper authority, isn't it? It's not like your headmaster for when you were at school telling you, go and do this or go and do that. When Jesus tells you to do something, you kind of do it. You kind of do, because he has a plan and we need to have that sense. So Jesus has given them authority. What does it say in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10? Talking about Matthew earlier on. Jesus had given them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. To heal every disease and sickness. And I guess we should be really clear on this, that Jesus didn't expect his disciples to be a substitute for Jesus. There weren't a whole bunch of mini Jesus. They were actually people that acted in his name. Not a substitute. The acts come from acting in his name. And that's a challenge for us, isn't it? To act in the name of Jesus. To have that authority. And of course, what makes this so exciting is that Jesus promised them real power. He promised that they would receive real power. That same power which is so often underestimated by Christians. So often, especially those of us in this evangelical Christian movement, forget. We go, God the Father, God the Son. What about God the Holy Spirit? It's a trinity. Three parts of God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that power has been around since the very, very beginning. If we go back to Genesis, let's go back to Genesis. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering <laughs> over the waters. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has been present since creation. Hasn't always been obvious to people, but God has always been the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus promises his disciples that this power is about to make a major impact. Can you imagine that in contemporary news terms? I told you before that when I used to teach journalism, I used to love working on the Friday. Because whichever group of students I had, I always used to say to them, this is Good Friday, this is how it would look had you reported this in rolling 24-hour news, had you tweeted it, although x it now because Twitter is now called X, had you done that, had you posted a video, had you put your stuff on social media, had you Instagrammed yourself, all that kind of stuff. How would it look? I used to tell the story of Good Friday through how the news would cover this. Can you imagine how it would have covered the excitement of the power of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit coming down? Because this is a mega day, isn't it? Jesus had a clear plan, and he made it clear that his followers would be clearly and properly equipped. So however nervous they were, they knew they were going to be properly equipped. Because what does it say in verse 5? John was baptised with water, but in a few days, you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. I wonder what the conversation was between it happening and the waiting. Well, you know, the Spirit's coming soon. We're going to be really baptised. What do we do for the next few days? Do we sit around eating ice cream? Do we, you know, what do we do? Because there was this great moment where the Holy Spirit was going to come down. In verse 8 it says, you will receive power. 
when the Holy Spirit comes to you. A powerful witness was going to spread, starting in Jerusalem, and then to all Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Because our faith is rooted in this power, this real power. So the plan was in place, and now it was time to receive the power. So let's have a look in chapter 2 of Acts, shall we? Chapter 2, reading from verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were saying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are these not the men who are speaking Galilean? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have too much wine. Always the way, always somebody will say, can't be true, can't be made up. When you hear about healings, and always somebody will say, no, that's what you think. So I remember when we once went to Taklan, and some of you were there, and somebody who was uh, really, really had very, very close sight was healed. And it was the first time I saw that happening, and I thought, wow, this really does happen. God does heal today through the power of the Spirit. And I, I, you know, I, I, I'd heard about it, and I believed it, but I'd never seen it. Wow, how incredible is that? The spirits at work. They were speaking in different tongues, in different languages. Can you imagine the uproar? Jerusalem being packed with people from all these different places. People all over the place speaking different languages. And then suddenly these seemingly uneducated Galileans speaking in so many different languages. That was a truly supernatural event. Our faith has to believe that supernatural things did and can happen. Humanly speaking, impossible. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, anything is possible. Nothing is impossible for God. When His Spirit comes down with power, anything can happen. And we read later in this chapter, and we'll all remember this, it's so well known, that you know, actually many people came to faith. In verse 38 it says, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus, in the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many people were added to his number? 3,000! Wow! That's the population of Burby and Gurdon, the whole built-up area between the two settlements, is about 3,000 people. Can you imagine what it would be like if tonight everyone came to trust in the Lord, the Spirit fell on Burby, on Gurdon, and all of those houses, and everyone, everyone came to give their lives to Christ. Because that's what happened. That is exactly what happened. Now, of course, they were all present. And of course, now we live in a much more kind of fragmented society. Most people in Burby and Gurdon tonight will not be thinking about Jesus. They'll not be listening to any teaching about Jesus. They'll be standing or sitting in front of the TV or playing games or doing something like that. But actually, if people's hearts can be opened, anything 
can happen because conversion is a supernatural thing. It's a result of people coming to faith. As we've always said, you can't argue people to heaven. You can point them, but it has to come down to an individual experience. And I wonder how many of us have experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder how much we'd like to experience so much more of the power of the Holy Spirit. How genuinely open are we to receiving that power? And how desperate are we to see the community around here come to knowing the Lord? Are we genuinely desperate? Or do we just accept, well, that's just not how it is? It's a real challenge, isn't it? It's a real challenge to us. Imagine the idea that everybody in Burby and Gurdon came to faith tonight. Do we actually have the slightest faith? Maybe it's smaller than mustard seed. Do we have that faith to believe it could happen? Because our faith is rooted in God's plan. It's not abstract, it's not vague, it's not random, it's rooted in a plan. But it's also backed up by the visible power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's move on to Acts chapter 3. So reading from verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, about three in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to a temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who were going into the temple court. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. So Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I don't have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple court, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power of godliness we've made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You had him mostly killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You deserve the Holy and Righteous One and asked that the murder of the release to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. And we are at 3.16. 3.16. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the face that comes through him that has given us this complete healing to him, as you can all see. You can all see. So we have here, don't we, a picture of a man who was dropped at the temple gate every day, presumably just sitting there, being left to beg for money every day. And if you've been to North Africa and parts of the Middle East, it's still common today. You, you see it. I remember noticing it in Egypt when I, a, a few months ago in Egypt. And rather like beggars outside churches, you can assume it's probably quite a good place to get money. It pricks at the conscience, doesn't it? And you, you see it outside churches in Aberdeen, 
Where do people sit? Outside the church. Ching ching. Hash time. And actually, I wonder how much of it stayed with man. And how much of it was just being exploited by somebody else, as so often is the case. And it's worth noting that despite the big job, the job that Christ had given to focus on Jerusalem and then work your way out to spread the gospel, actually, in this situation, they still found time, Peter and John still found enough time to pray, to go to the temple. And of course they were Jewish, and therefore they followed many of the Jewish traditions. The difference, of course, was that they knew that this had reached its climax in Jesus as the Messiah. But they still prayed. And that's another challenge for us. It's a real challenge in our busy lives in finding time to pray. We're full of faith, but that faith can weaken. Our faith is strengthened when we're praying and talking to the Lord. But they still had time for the individual. So I love thinking about big plans. You know, what was the big political picture here? What's the big future for this country? Or what's the big future for this, that, and the other? And so often when you get involved in thinking about strategy, you forget that actually when it comes to God's word, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. It's about caring for individuals. It's about seeing individuals. And the question I'm most likely to ask, ask God is, how can you see us all and know us all individually? It blows my mind that you can have an individual relationship with the, you, 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 all of us, and still control the world. That feels like more than enough responsibility for anyone. But God is God. And as the disciples in that era, and as us as disciples now, we have a responsibility for individuals. One on one. And this is a classic case. This man, he was there begging, expecting to get money, but in fact what Peter and John offered him was something far beyond gold and silver. It was something of a new life. Not in the name of Peter, not in the name of John, but in the name of Jesus. And again, what a challenge to us that we call on the name of Jesus. You know, when we're being challenged by the devil in those moments, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has that, in the night and elsewhere, tempted by this or tempted by that, how often do we call out, in the name of Jesus, go? Let's not be frightened to call on the name of Jesus. I don't think Jesus is worried about us doing it. You know, how much time do we hear people using the name Jesus in all the wrong ways? Maybe a few more times we should be using it in the right ways. In Jesus' name. So what's happening in verse 7? Instantly, instantly, the man's feet and ankles become strong. We have so many people in this fellowship and more broadly in the community who've got really, really difficult health problems at the moment. And I'm not saying that they're all going to be healed by the power of the Holy Spirit tonight or in the days ahead. But it is our responsibility to pray for those people and to call on the Spirit because people do get healed. Not for us to say who does and who doesn't, but people do get healed. And I'm sure many of us have seen that experience for real. And this case was stunning. Instantly, it happened. How exciting was that? What did he do? He went walking, jumping, and most importantly, praising God. Walking, jumping. Do the walk, I can bet you the jumping, and I think I did better at the praising. Praising <laughs> God. How important is that? What did the people say when they saw this? They, went, <gasps> they were filled with wonder and amazement, it says in verse 10, at what happened to them. You can imagine they would be. They've seen this guy for ages, just there. And we can think about some of the miracles that Jesus performed. And then suddenly, all changed. You can imagine the commotion that followed. There was a mad rush to this area known as Solomon's Colonnade. Quick, everyone to Solomon's Colonnade. 
I don't think you would have to shout it. I think people just would have gone to find out what was going on. And we have this picture of Peter and John, and it says with the beggar holding on to them. I guess it's kind of like this, you know. He was just, you know, in awe of this. He just couldn't let them go. And, and you know, like a child, you know, when a child holds on to you and doesn't let you go. I think it would be much the same that, you know, that this guy who was healed just wouldn't want to let go of them because he'd been given something that was so new. And I imagine he had one hand praising the Lord and the other one grabbing onto poor old Peter's leg and saying, come on, let me go. But maybe not, but you know, like Ali and that so would say, probably just carry on, let me go. But essentially, it would have been a commotion. It would have been a real commotion. And all this stuff's going on. And we have this picture of all this chaos. So it sounds like a good time for speech. Now, to build with you, every time is a good time for speech. You know, a number of occasions I've been at, a number of dinners I go to, events I go to, and I kind of, you know, feel the need to say something. And they always go, oh, Andrew, what's the say something then? And I just the right speech to people. Uh, so I do occasionally write speeches, quite often actually write speeches to people. But actually, it's always a good time for a speech. But the Holy Spirit didn't just equip Peter to heal people. It also gave him the right words at the right time. Yeah, and for those people who struggle to speak, remember that actually the Holy Spirit does give you the right words at the right time. Because there's a reason for that. Despite the power there's going to be opposition. And you need that power to confront that opposition. Let's go back to Matthew, chapter 10, verse from verse 17 to 20. What did Jesus say? Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you in their synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be as you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Isn't that just great? Isn't that a great sense of confidence? The Spirit of your Father. And of course, what happens is Peter doesn't hold back. He just goes, goes for it. Now, of course, it's hard for us in our culture to know when to go for it and when not to. And most of the answer is we probably don't, unless we're in front of a group of Christians like this, where it's easy. It's dead easy to speak amongst a group of believers. Much tougher to go around the corner into the pub and have the same conversation. A million times tougher. So there's all this rammy going on, and Peter starts by giving a bit of context. You know, God glorifies Jesus. But then it could be cuts to the chase based on his own personal witness because he was around and he saw it for himself. You handed him over to be killed in verse 13. You disowned the holy and righteous one in verse 14. You killed the author of life in verse 15. So he's pretty tough on them. Pretty tough on them. Because he had an opportunity to do that because actually an opportunity had arisen that bring a healing and he could talk about it. And we need to pray for opportunities that come along to give us it. It's, I'm, I'm not a great fan of walking with a sandwich board up and down the high street going, the end is night. I, I, I recognise that people that do that do it from a position of faith, but I'm not sure it actually makes much difference. I think we need opportunities for witnessing. We were talking about the Dutch earlier on, or Mike was talking about the Dutch, uh, I had a, I, when I flew to Netherlands a couple of weeks ago, I had a great conversation with a guy all the way to the Netherlands on the plane. I never saw the plane take off. Next thing I knew, we were in Amsterdam. And I hadn't noticed the journey at all. Now, we talked about lots and lots of things, which was great. Really, really nice guy. We talked about loads of things. But I did talk a bit about how I spent my Sunday. I did talk a bit about my children and what they do. And he talked about how he used to go to Sunday school. So I'm not saying that I took him all the way on that journey to a point at which he gave his life to Christ. But I am saying I'm not frightened to raise these points in ways that bring people together. And then God will open up opportunities if he thinks that's appropriate. So we do need the courage and the power of the Holy Spirit to speak. 
So actually now, we're back at Acts chapter 33, verse 16, which is where we started. The beggar, he's noticed lots of people. He's healed by faith in the name of Jesus. His life has been transformed from weak to strong by the Holy Spirit. And it happened by calling on the name of Jesus. The result was not partial healing, but complete hearing, healing. And more than that, all could see it. People could see it. And we need to live in that faith. So let's return to that. That 3.16 verse. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man who you see and know was made strong. It's Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him when given this complete as you can all see. Amazing things can happen when we have faith in Jesus. By calling on the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Our challenge tonight is: Are we seeking God the Holy Spirit in all that we do? So, great stand, please feel free to do so. We can sing uh, a short song that you're probably very familiar to. Wait one. Seek that the Spirit will come down on us. <laughs>